My name is Maiko. For those of you who don't know me, um, just a quick intro or bio about me. I've been working in basically executive coaching, in agile coaching, um, for the last 10 years. Uh, I've worked with teams and organizations to help them with their leadership. Recently, I trained in agile coaching, in fact, with UST Global, big supporting group here today. <laughs> Um, so, with my experience of the last few years and the coach clients that I have in leadership entering the agile context, I was wondering what kind of leadership do we need in an agile context? To start off with, I would like to ask you one question. What do gents, leadership and love, have in common. They all about relationships that use some form of communication and collaboration. There's no single definition of it. And they're about human relationships that seek some form of organization. To me, Jazz is like love. I don't fully understand it, but I do know what I feel when I'm in the experience of it. And I think that's somehow similar to when we encounter different leadership styles. We kind of know what works and what doesn't work. But it's not always obvious why that is. Today, I want to talk about three things. What makes leadership fragile? Give you a bit of an overview of the current theories and models that are out there right now in terms of leadership. And how we could possibly move towards Agile. My intention and my objective for this talk is, as I said, just to give you an overview, a snapshot. No right or wrong. I think my mic is safe. No right or wrong. I can hear myself. <laughs> and ideally, I would like you to walk away feeling inspired to rethink the models that you have in your mind or that you encounter with your clients or in your organizations. What makes leadership fragile in an agile context? What do I mean by fragile? Fragile in the sense of Leadership not working to its fullest potential. But here I'm leaning on a model from Richard Branson, which is called the Collaborative Leadership Model. He found eight items that point us to things that may not work in an agile context. The first one here, belief that power comes from a position of authority. working. Do I need a hand mic, which I didn't want to have? Okay, so <laughs> this is like Murphy's Law, isn't it? <laughs> Which are, welcome to the agile context. Things always happen that you don't expect to happen. <laughs> okay, okay, I was going to use my whole body to express myself today, so let's see how that goes. Okay, so first of all, as I said, uh, power with a position of authority, right? So when I think about this one, I connect to the idea of blame, right? Since I have the power, I can tell you you're wrong, right? I think this is something like that we've heard quite often in the last few years when we look into the Western media, particularly the United States, because there's a famous statement that says, you are fired. That's the kind of leadership that in 2020 is around us. So, with this in mind, I would like you to look at these eight items and take a moment to reflect what kind of statements or phrases do you hear in your organizations, at your clients, that point to fragile leadership in an agile context. Or in other words, 
that make you feel, that make you cringe, that make you go, oh, I'm not sure, like this is definitely not what we want. For that purpose, I'd like you to quickly turn around, find two or three people to talk to, and find those statements and phrases that can identify any of those eight topics. Okay, so you have like three or four minutes to do that. Have a quick chat to whoever's around you in whatever language you want, and then we're gonna recollect um, in four minutes. Any questions? Nope? All right, go for it. Four minutes. <laughs> functioning maybe we can hear from one or two people only try to be concise in a nutshell what are typical phrases um, that or statements that you have identified that may have the point to a fragile leadership maybe if you want the mic we have one available now anyone yeah you have one here wait would you want to wait for the mic Quickly. No, they're too, sorry. Well, there you go, you know, adapt and change. <laughs> no? Yeah, if you don't mind standing up, then we can all appreciate. All right. <laughs> uh, whose, whose responsibility is this? Great, okay, excellent. We identify with that, yeah, we can raise our hands, we can cheer. Okay, another one? We have one in the front. Well, it was quite related also. It's also about the growth properties. So, hey, forget about it. Yeah. 
uh, forget about it. It's not your responsibility. Focus on your uh, job. Hmm. Okay, I think it's clear when we look at these eight items from Richard Branson that some, more or less we can identify what doesn't work with leadership, right? Yeah, like we kind of know what we don't want, as always in life. <laughs> it's easy to point to the things that we don't like, that we don't want. But what do we need? What kind of leadership do we need? So, as I said before, I wanted to provide you with a quick map, or as I like to see it, like a snapshot. This is a snapshot of the leadership models that are out there. By no means this is extensive, meaning there'll be loads more leadership models out there that I haven't recollected. But I found these segments that help me to understand whenever I come across a new leadership model, to kind of place it and see, okay, so what is that model or theory working on? The first one you can appreciate is called the great man or trade school. But the very name of it, you can imagine how old it is, right? Because no one thought to call it the great woman school. <laughs> anyway, here we have the slogan, born not made, right? You come, you pop onto this planet, planet, you have this great charisma and personality, and because of who you are, this is your leadership, right? So this, these theories look at your personality, the charisma, and whatever you bring onto the table. Second one is behavioral or style school. Basically, they argue that leadership is something that can be learned. Here we have great models that I'm sure resonate with you, starting from Maya Briggs, Emotional Intelligence, Goldman, uh, Arbinger Institute, Growth Mindset, all these things that help us grow, that help us discover who we are as a person in order to relate better to others. Now, what do the first two schools have in common? They solely look at leaderships, leadership in terms of the leader, the person per se, right? They don't necessarily look at the context. So the next school looks at what's happening, what kind of situation are we in? Does that ask for a different leadership style? Right? The typical model is the situational leadership model for coaching, mentoring, directing, etc. Right? So host leadership, like what kind of position do you want to take depending on the context, depending on what's needed. The next school up is contingent, contingency or interaction school. Basically meaning the right leader for the right context. Last and definitely not least, transactional and transformational school inside out. If leadership is not connected to a person, if leadership doesn't equal leader, but leadership as a capacity, then A, it can be learned, it depends on the context, and if it can be learned, then maybe I can step into leadership, I can step out of leadership, and maybe I want to share leadership. In this way, leadership becomes more agile transformative. Anyone could technically step in and out because it's an ability that you've learned. Just as a map, just as something to ponder about. I'm not going to go into the details of any of those. But whenever you come across in the next week about like from leadership model, because as they pop up on the internet like mushrooms, Maybe this map helps us to place those, right? It's not, as you can see, they look at them as like clouds or bubbles, right? Like there are no rigid boundaries here, they're overlapping, but they give us a bit of an, of an idea. Are we talking about leader development or are we talking about leadership <coughs> development? What do we expect from a leader? We are humans, right? We love to project ourselves onto other humans. So let's start with the person. Let's start with the leader. What do we want from a leader? Let's focus on the being aspect. Tell me, what do you, how do you want a leader to be? Shout out a few adjectives or words or whatever. How do you want a leader to be? Shout out, even if you don't have a mic. Supportive. Enabling. Open, 
humble, inspirational, inspirational. sorry, empathic, mm -hmm. coherent. That's a good one. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we know what we want from them, right? And we could come up with a whole other list of what we want those people to do, right? And we're not going to go into that. But I think it becomes apparent that we have a certain expectations when we look at leadership. Apparently, these folks are the ones that we admire most in 2019. So what do these leaders have in common? How can we identify leadership factors to work with? There are six main leadership factors, starting with capacity. Capacity meaning there's a certain knowledge or know-how, learning or something that that person knows how to do, right, that we may not have learned yet, okay? For that reason, they may have achieved something. <coughs> that very achievement at whatever they excel, may that be sports, politics, economics, human rights, makes them somehow different from the rest of us, right? They've got a bit of achievement there. For that purpose, we like to give them statues. We like to treat leaders differently. Sometimes we call them VIP, very important people. They may have a different or private mode of transport, or they may even be acknowledged by our governments or other institutions for what they have achieved and done. And how have they done it? Usually, they have this strong, strong sense of participation. They're active and proactive. They like to get things done or get other people to do it for them, depending on the style. But basically, they have a vision, they want to go somewhere, and they're connected to the community. They want to get things done. Hence, they're not scared to take on a certain responsibility. Sometimes when a leader has a vision, this vision may go against mainstream. That leader takes on a certain responsibility and does it anyway. That's why we admire them. There's a certain courage related to leadership. And then lastly, situation. Situation is a funny one. Situation could be combined of the previous ones, but for example, if you think about context quite different to ours maybe, maybe in terms of like royalty, you may be born as a prince or princess, and because of that situation, you end up in a role of leadership. Just as one example. What do we need? of leadership in an Agile context. We all know about Agile. Well, in fact, I think you know more than I do. But from what I understood, we want teams to be autonomous, self-organized. We want them to take ownership as a person and at the same time communicate and collaborate. There are no mistakes, just learnings. That's our motto feedback loops, and so on. So I thought, okay, if this is what agility is all about, what if we apply that to leadership? And here are some steps that may work for us. Okay, first one up. Take turns in leading. If leadership is an ability, a capacity that we can learn and that can be shared, we can all take turns in leading. We can step into it and out of it, depending on the context and depending on the people that surround us. Number two, learn how to listen and how to project your ideas. Now, learn how to listen is not just to listen to what's being said, but also what's behind it, to get the message. And how to not just say what you want, but actually project your ideas. Remember, leadership is about influencing people. 
Third, adapt to plan to adapt and adapt your plan, right? What happened with the mic? You kind of have to adjust, improvise, and adapt. In the context of leadership, it's easier said than done. But I do have a positive example from one of my recent clients from actually two years ago, which was way before I stepped into the Agile community, and who is someone that I highly admire. She founded a company in Barcelona, um, producing like cosmetic products, high-end cosmetic products that you can't get over the counter. Basically, it's a global um, distribution network for surgeons, etc. Right. So the team in Barcelona is actually quite small. There are only like 12 people, I think. And when I came in there and they asked me for some team building and whatnot, I actually thought. You guys don't need me. They're doing great. You know, they had this great vibe. In fact, they, they had this look at Rainier and they even had this bell and they go ding, 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 ding. Every time something great happened, they were into celebration mode, whatnot. So it was this context of having this great team, the right people at the right time, and an amazing team spirit. But success was on the way. The team needed to extend. They needed more people. So it was kind of a situation where she went, Okay, do I choose that person or do I let my team choose that person? And that for me was the most inspiring story from the last few years in terms of leadership, how someone not necessarily knowing anything about agility learns quickly how to adapt to the situation and goes, okay, this is more important than my leadership. Number four. Empower vulnerability and learning. Now, when it comes to learning, I always imagine I have this fantasy about the agile community that we kind of like learning, right? We like go to these coach camps and I don't know, we like to iterate, we have reviews and retros and we like to collect the data and then on that data kind of take our learnings, right? For that, I have a recent example of a client who um, works in, in a company that is really traditional, they've been around for more than a hundred years in the chemical sector, so just to give you an idea, it's like the kind of managers that kind of start the, in the company when they're like in their early 20s or early 30s, and like basically all their life they work in this one company and they work their way up, right? A very traditional company. I did an executive coaching session with her, like a process rather, and in one of them, I only mentioned agile. We didn't really have time to get into it. In the next coaching session, she's like, Micah, Micah, come to my office. So she had this whole board there, like a whiteboard, where she wrote down all the actions of her team. This is a, sorry, she, this is a team in the finance department, right? So you can imagine like gritty, nitty details, loads of pressure, loads of deadlines, right? And she was micromanaging her team. So she decided to look it up for herself, to get the learning out of the internet, basically, and directly apply it. Okay, fair enough, she didn't use any post-its. <laughs> but she wrote everything that she had to deal with with her team. She had, I think, weeklies, maybe they weren't dailies, but she started to iterate, to visualize the workflow, and to have a conversation with her team, rather than telling them what to do. For me, an excellent example when it comes to this step of learning and applying it directly as a leader, as a manager. Now, vulnerability is kind of different, right? Empowering vulnerability has a lot to do with the 360 leadership idea, right? Of all of us stepping in and out of leadership. Because when you think back about leaders that you've met, the ones that kind of stand out for you may be ones that you would maybe, maybe these are my words, but maybe we could call them like they have an authentic leadership style. <coughs> when we are being authentic, usually we're showing some form of vulnerability. Now, my dad here would highly disagree, right? Born in the 50s, his leadership idea is, no, 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 there is no way. You need to know your stuff, and you can't show any vulnerability. Because you're in front of people, you're leading a company, right? Like, you can't show any vulnerability. So for me, 
stepping into this agile world and having this background of my dad, who comes from a different background, having his own company, always raises the question of, these people are around us. I have a lot of dads and mothers of that kind at work, right, that have been taught that this is the right way to do. You can't show vulnerability in front of people. So knowing this, that this, these could be steps to move towards Agile, the question is, how do we do it? How do we go into an organization, whatever your title may be, an Agile coach, enterprise coach, consultant, whoever you are, that comes into an organization and wants to address leadership? I came up with a quick checklist. Let's see if it works for you. First of all, in every organization, we have a person or even a leadership team, right? So when we look at leadership again in terms of the leader, we will want to look at what's behind it, what's in their minds, right? The typical coaching aspects of looking at the values, beliefs, fears, and most importantly, as has been said before, the coherence between doing and being. That's something to look out for. Secondly, when we come into an organization, we want to have a look at the relationships, right? We have this leader or the leadership team, they're doing their stuff, and they are in a relationship with other people, with their teams, teams of teams, even the whole organization, if you want. Now here, we want to have a look at a few aspects. For example, the Agile concept, the right people at the right time. What does that mean? Do they have the right level of competency? Do they have access to information? Now this is a big one, isn't it? Because when access to information and competence meet, people are able to make coherent decisions. This is a crucial point to look at in our clients and organizations. Last but not least, let's think global. Most of our companies are big, right? The organizations that we work for or that we work with are maybe more than one company, they're a group, etc. right? It's a massive system that we're talking about. They may be in different markets. System here can be understood on all different levels. It could be a cultural system, it could be a human system of who we have in there, economic, political, you name it. The only thing I'm pointing to in this checklist is to be aware that you can't just apply any kind of leadership theory or model to any kind of system. If you don't understand the system that you're dealing with and just do whatever you think is right, because you like, I don't know, agile leadership, for example, or the host leadership, or whatever it is, right? And you haven't analyzed the system yet, I can assure you, you're going to hit a brick wall. So, how do we do all this? Okay, so we know what agility is, we know what we expect from a leader, we have a bit of a checklist, right? What do we do with this? <coughs> I encourage you to really connect and listen in. If leadership is about a person in the first instance, if leader development is what we're looking for, then leader development equals self-development. In other words, if you walk into a company as a consultant for this matter, and you want to help a leader, you can only take that leader as far as you have gone yourself. So my message for you today is, work on yourself. Look at all the amazing models that we have out there in terms of behavioral leadership and get to know yourself. How do you relate with others? How do you exercise your own leadership? When do you step up and when do you pull back? 
What's your style? What are your strengths? From that, with empathy, you un can understand what's happening to the leader. And from that, you can co-create and help and step in. So work on yourself first. The next one is about the we. This is probably my favorite one. This is about the relationship that we create with others. This is about the identity of who we are as a team, right? For whatever that means. And coming into the Agile context, for me it was interesting stuff. What I found personally was that, okay, we work in an organization sometimes, and I've started with Agile, we're kind of like coaching in this, I would call it like this agile bubble, right? Like we have loads of teams, they're doing agile, they kind of get it, they use post-its, they do their stuff, right? Maybe it's not perfect, but they get it, right? They're doing agile. And with that comes this sense of an agile identity, right? We are in this bubble, this agile bubble that creates a we, which in itself is great. Like this is what we want. We want a spirit of this is we rather than the silo thinking, right? What we all want to uh, inhibit. But at the same time, it raises a question. This cloud of we, when do you hit the frontier? When do you hit, like, when does that stop? That's something interesting to look at. If you have an agile bubble, and this is, it has frontiers, whatever is outside of that frontier isn't part of that we. So we need to ask ourselves in the organizations, when it comes to leadership, what kind of we do we want? Do we want to include other departments? Do we want to include other organizations that may be part of the group? Do we want to include our partners even? What kind of we do we want to exercise in terms of leadership? I can tell you from personal experience that I had the privilege to work with a global fashion brand in the last one and a half years. A brand that has products on all continents, maybe not all of the countries, but most of the hot countries, I would say. And basically, we had the privilege to coach the leadership team uh, for one and a half years. We did the whole uh, team analysis, the five dysfunctions of the team, etc. You know, like you look at the team, how they communicate, etc. And then we found out there's no identity, no spirit of the bigger we on the global leadership team. We were all like, oh my god, like it was like so obvious that that was wrong and it took us a while to get there. That insight changed the whole team dynamic around. That was the strongest part that everyone took away from the leadership development to connect to the bigger we and who are we, who do we want to project to the world since we have a product that is global. I encourage you to think beyond. Think global, think system. Whatever that means. Speak up if you have to, or shut up. Fail or improvise. Lean into your teams, lean into other people, lean into other styles of leadership, or take over. Do what feels right. In other words, stop talking, start listening. And with this, I didn't have a great finishing line for this talk. <laughs> it just didn't emerge out of the system. Um, I'd like to maybe open a discussion and have a bit of a longer Q&A and see how this landed for you. Um, and maybe have a Q&A or a discussion or whatever feels like for the remaining minutes that we have. Why did this just land like a bomb on you? <laughs> okay, can we have a mic? Um, sorry, don't know where. Do we have someone? 
Hello, do we have a mic? Maybe you just have to stand up and project your voice into the audience. Hi there. Uh, my question is, uh, I love the whole the whole band. The point is, how you get the management team to want to work with you as a coach? How do you want them to work with you? Yeah. Well, are you there already or are you not there? <coughs> Think about the system. Where are you? Are you already part of the system? Have they already called you and you're there? Or you just project your ideas and like, I really want to work with that client? No, it's like more like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> Hearing me through. Oh, okay. um, it was kind of, okay, you are there because the organization says that we have to have an IA coach, you know? So mm -hmm. you are just there. This is a piece of the organization you, sh you should have because everyone has one. It's like, okay, everybody has a doll. So you are an IEL coach, so we should, you, we should have one in our mm. area. I have this kind of thing. Okay, so a typical situation where we're being obliged to do something that no one has asked for, right? Is that what we're talking yeah. about? Okay, so that happens quite often. In fact, I can relate that maybe to um, my executive coaching experience because usually it's um, HR that decides, okay, uh, that person needs some coaching. <laughs> So uh, it's great, so you get this client, you know, and he or she comes and they're like, well, I'm here and I'm supposed to do some executive coaching, which is a similar situation maybe. Um, so the way I deal with that is like connecting to the needs. I'm a strong believer that if we connect to our own needs and we identify the needs of the other, in this case our client, we can help or, or I don't know whatever the word is right like helping is a strong word but we can intervene with our client in a way that they get value out of it but for that purpose we need to find a little bit of curiosity in us you know we need to be curious about okay so I understand the situation okay this goes back to the system right like the system has decided okay you do that right like you're that agile coach and you have to do this and we all have to do this to start off with no one has to do anything you could even raise that question like if you don't want to be here, <laughs> you know what's gonna happen like, you know, I'm, I've got a provocative style when it comes to coaching and anyone who knows me. Um, so I would provoke the system and see what happens, right? Um, but I don't know, we can also hear from other ideas. I mean, as anyone, I'm not the master of anyone. If anyone wants to chip in an idea here with that situation, because maybe more people can identify with it. Yeah, do you want to say something? Do you need a mic? We're going to make a lot of sweat today. <laughs> Hey, um, I don't have a, like a metric recipe for you, right? Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking uh, it connects to something that you said that you need to understand how can you help other people or how can you solve problems that are um, affecting them and how can you relate to them, right? So I'm sure that like these, the group of managers or you know, these leaders, there is something that is bothering them. There is something that they want to solve. There is something that they need help with that is not running very well, right? You need to, you need to find out what is that thing and try to attack it from a perspective of how can I bring value to solve this problem that either you're not aware of or that you're aware of but nobody is acting toward it. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, for me, this is my checklist, right? Like, we need to find out where we put, um, I don't know how to say that in English now, La Palanca, you know? Like, where do you want to start? <laughs> how do you say that? Yeah, leave leave sorry about that. <laughs> that happens in a Spanish context. So, um, so where do we want to start, right? We need to, we need to analyze what's going on. Are we talking about the system? Is it maybe uh, the leader or I don't know, whoever was being put in charge of this agile transformation that needs to be looked at? And are, are we saying we're doing agile, but we're actually pushing, 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 and we're doing anything that isn't actually agile? Then that's also to, something to look at. But how do we look at it? Well, that depends, right? Like, we can't put those people in a situation of vulnerability because that's not something that they like or honor, right? That was a fear we had about the vulnerability. That's not easy to do. I mean, in fact, I don't even find it very easy to be vulnerable in front of people. And I've done like four years of Gestalt therapy and I don't know, 10 years of coaching and it's still like, you know, like I wasn't brought up like this. You can't be vulnerable in front of people. So 
Where we start depends on the situation. That's why I thought this checklist could help us. Do we want to look at the leader? Is there a message there? Are there fears, beliefs that that person has that I may have to address on a one-to-one? -one? You know? Is there something I want to talk to about the teams? Okay, if the teams are being put in a situation of obligation, then maybe that's something that we can talk about in a retro. Right? We can, we can voice that. Because think about the system. The system always has a voice. And it will become apparent. So my opinion is just address it. Address the voice of a system in a retrospective. That's what I would do. Do you have any more questions or ideas? Jordi in the back. Here we go. Run, run, run. There's a German movie called Run Lola Run. We can call it Alvaro. <laughs> run Alvaro Run. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. It was a wonderful presentation. My question would be rather kind of thought process, which is, uh, don't you get the feeling with all your leadership background, then all of us agilists, when we focus on, yeah, I know about leadership, management 3.0 and agile leadership, don't you get the feeling that we are a little bit imposters? Thank you. Well, um, I mean, I don't think it has anything to do with the agile community. But I think, um, and this is now my personal opinion, um, from the brief experience that I've had, but it also relates to the executive coaching world actually, is that, um, and this may not go for everyone, but I feel sometimes we're like junkies when it comes to learning, right? Like more, 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 more. Like we want more courses and more certificates and more, 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 you know? So we feed our cognitive level a lot. So I haven't talked about this today at all, but if we want coherence, it's not just being and doing, but it's also the coherence between what we think and what we feel and how we express that in the world. So if we are only on a stance on the level of a cognitive level where we have all these certifications and learnings and whatnot, but as I said before, you haven't walked the talk, then that will limit how much impact you can have on people. Because as someone said to me recently, you don't remember people by what they have said or done. You remember people by how they have made you feel. <coughs> and with that, looking at Alvaro, I think I have to conclude. <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention. And, uh, <laughs>